Good afternoon, everybody. That was beautiful. Let's open up our Bibles yet again. So Revelation chapter 21. And I'll read verses 1 through 8 again in your hearing. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice coming from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Our sermon title for this morning is, Ain't That Good News? Let's pray. Lord, Father, now it's your time. We're asking, O Lord, that we'll hear a word from you, a word from on high, a word directly from your throne, O God. Holy Spirit, fill me. I am yours. No one's here to hear my voice. No one's here to hear my words, Lord. They're here to hear from you. And we're asking that it will be done. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Before we really begin to dig deeper into this text, before we begin to unpack it, we have to understand it in its proper context. And for our background information this morning, I want us to focus on the readers of Revelation. You see, if you remember, the book of Revelation is actually a letter that was written by John and sent to seven churches in Asia Minor. If you remember in Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2, these churches, they're listed out. There's the church in Ephesus. Sardis, there's the church in Pergamum, in Thyatira, there's the church in Philadelphia, there's the church in Laodicea, and these different churches, they receive a direct message from Jesus Christ through John. When you read chapters 2 and chapter 3, you see Jesus spelling out what's going on in these different churches. Now, outside of the Bible, when we look at the history of the churches that are not mentioned in Revelation, we see that these churches have actually just come through a terrible persecution. It's been a few decades since Rome has trampled the Christians, since they have separated people from their homes. The Jews that are in this area now, they are gone from Judea. They've been taken out of Israel, and now they're living in a strange land, living with strange people. The people that are actually from Asia Minor, the people that are actually from the different cities that are listed in this book, they've been ostracized. They're no longer in connection with some of their family members, some of their friends, all because they decided to follow Jesus Christ. 
All of these people in this book are experiencing some serious external pressures. They're all experiencing some sort of persecution. But not only that, they're also experiencing some internal problems as well. And I'm not just talking about problems within the church. I'm not just talking about people arguing with each other, people not able to get along. I'm not just talking about politics and people trying to move up in positions in church and no longer following the gospel. I'm talking about each and every individual member in this church is dealing with something on the inside. You see, you have to remember, these people are regular people. So there are still sins that they're trying to get over. There's still things that they're trying to inside get rid of. There are things inside of them that they know are wrong. And so when they receive this letter, as they read through what it is that Jesus is telling them, they're seeing Jesus point out personal issues. When you read through chapter 2, when you read through chapter 3, you see Jesus saying things like, you've lost your first love. You're no longer spreading the gospel like I wanted you to because you're becoming selfish. Some of you are lying. You're spreading false doctrine. There are things that you're saying. There are things that you're holding on to. And you're bringing other people along with you and sending people astray. Some of you in this church are having problems with sexual immorality. There are problems that you're having with being with lying. And there are problems that you're having with just straight up being mean. Some of you can't make up your minds on if you're going to follow me or not. These are all problems that Jesus brings up at the very beginning of this letter. And as we continue to move through the letter, we see Jesus telling John that there is a separation between the saints of God and the evil people that live in the world. As you continue to move along through the book of Revelation, as you continue on through this letter, as you've seen in the later chapters, in chapters 13, 14, and 15, we get this picture of the saints of God. We've got these people that are so close to God that they're following Him wherever He goes. They have God's name written on their foreheads. And then you've got these people that don't follow the lamb, but they follow after the dragon. They follow after the beast. They're selfish people. They no longer care about the other things in the world. They no longer care about God, and they begin to worship themselves. As we continue on in the book, we see that even after death, there is still another separation that is made. You see, there's a first resurrection where God raises the people that have followed him to eternal life. But then there's a second resurrection. And in this second resurrection, those that have followed the beast, those that have decided that it is better to serve themselves and serve Satan rather than serve God, are raised but to eternal death. And so as the people that read this letter read through and see that there is this clear distinction that Jesus has made, they find themselves trying to figure out where they fit You see, the problem is what this letter does is it causes them to look at themselves. It forces them to see who they are, to think about what it is that they're doing in their own personal lives, and try to place themselves as either a saint or a sinner. And so as they read, as they think about the things that's going on internally, as they think about the things that Jesus has pointed out, the picture's not looking too good. Because you see, they understand and see that they themselves are not following Jesus the way that they need to. Not the way that it's drawn out in Revelation. And so when we look at that, and we understand what those people are going through when we're reading this letter, and we compare it to us today, it's no different. You see, there's a reason that we get nervous when we read the book of Revelation. There's a reason that churches don't say anything about it. There's a reason that preachers don't get up and preach it. Because when you flip through this book and you're trying to find things to uplift someone and you're trying to find things to help someone make it through the week, it gets hard. Because Jesus starts pointing things out in our lives that are not right. Jesus starts pointing things out in our hearts that we cannot line up with the good news that he tries to give us in this book. 
Jesus tries to say that I am God, I have come, I've forgiven you of your sins, and I'm going to write my name on your forehead and you follow me wherever you go. But when I look at myself in the mirror, that's not the person I see. You see, the person that I see in the mirror is someone who stumbles. The person that I see in the mirror is someone that I, I know what I've done just this past week. I think about the things that I've said. I think about the actions that I've committed. And I know that I am not measuring up to the word saint. When I look at myself, I hate what I see. And I know that God cannot be happy with me. And I know that when it gets to the end of this book, when it gets to God casting people into the lake of fire, that I've got to be in that number. Because I've lied. Because I've been mean. Because I've done wrong. I have to end up in that lake. But you see, that's a trick of the devil. He wants to make you think that the book of Revelation is a revelation about you. When in all actuality, the book of Revelation is a revelation about Jesus Christ. You see, the book of Revelation, it's not a book that's full of prophecies that's supposed to scare you and to make you think that you can't make it. It's a book that's actually full of hope. It's a book that is trying to tell you... If you continue to live the way that you're living, yeah, you won't make it. But if you shift your focus to Jesus Christ, it is a surefire thing that you're going to make it to the kingdom. That you're going to be standing with Jesus Christ on that sea of glass. That you're going to be standing before the throne of God. You see, even though this book can be confusing, there's good news. And so when you read Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, Jesus makes that clear distinction between those that will make it and those that don't. But he gives good news to those of us that aren't sure. So now what we're going to do is, I'm going to, follow me, I'm going to preach this a little bit differently. We're going to move from verses 8 up to verse 5. And then we're going to jump from verse 1 and work our way down to verse 4. So follow me. Is that okay? All right. So let's jump into verse 8. Verse 8 says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now see, this is what I'm talking about. This is that nervous stuff. Because when you look at this list, we're all up in here. When I look at the cowardly, you see, this word cowardly, it's the word that Jesus uses when he describes the disciples when they're on that boat and they're scared and so they run to Jesus who sleep at the bottom. He says, why are you afraid? You see, being cowardly is when you do not believe that God can work things out in your life. When you are so afraid of what is going on around you that you no longer believe that God can work something for you, that means you are cowardly. And if you're cowardly, according to this, you're not going to make it. The next thing says the faithless. And see, this word faithless is not talking about if you believe in God or not, because that's just lip service. It's your actions that make you faithful or faithless. So if you proclaim to know God, if you proclaim to be saved by Jesus Christ, but your actions don't seem to line up with the words that are coming out of your mouth, according to this book, you're not going to make it. The next is the detestable. Now, what this word is saying is we're talking about people that are worshiping idols. And yeah, okay, we think, yeah, we don't have idols, right? Because we all worship Jesus. We're all here. We're all praying and doing all these things. But if you've got something that is blocking you from getting to Jesus Christ, if there is something that is blocking your relationship with God and is getting in the way of you getting to the throne of God, that is idol worship. Because you're spending more time worshiping that thing than you are worshiping God. That is what this is saying when it says detestable. And according to this book, you're not going to make it. Next, it 
talks about the murderers, and that, 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 that's, that's normal, that makes sense, right? People that kill other people, but if you're sitting in these pews and you're keeping people out of this church because of the things that you hold inside, because of the things and standards that you hold people to, and you keep people from the throne of God, you have killed their eternal life. That is murder, and according to this book, you're not going to make it. If I continue on, it says the sexually immoral. Again, self-explanatory, right? If you're going around and sleeping with whoever it is that you want to sleep with, this says that you're not going to make it. But also, it's not just sleeping with other people, but it's cheating on God. If you're cheating on God and you're sitting in this building right now, this book says you're not going to make it. If we're talking about sorcery, we're, it, it, magic, right? Harry Potter wands and everything. If you're sinning, you're aligning yourself with demons. That is sorcery. That means, according to this book, you're not going to make it. It says idolaters, liars. I mean, come on, do, do I need to continue? You see yourself in this, right? I get nervous reading this thing because, again, I can't wrap my head around how I'm supposed to make it. Because according to this book, I'm not supposed to. I should be in that lake of fire because at the end of this text, what this is saying is that I earned it. I worked to be in that lake. But look at this. Let's go up one verse in verse 7. It says, the one who conquers, the one who conquers, the one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. You see, there's a difference between someone who is living this life and someone who is struggling in this life. There's a difference between those that are comfortable in the way that they're living and those that are fighting every day, trying to get over the things that are holding them back. There are people that are sitting in this room, the people that are here worshiping God, you're here crying out to Jesus Christ because you need help. You're in a battle, you're in a fight, and you know that the longer you stay the same way you are, the closer you are to the lake of fire. But you don't want to be in the lake of fire. You want to stand with Jesus Christ, you want to be in the throne, but things keep holding you back. Verse 7 is talking about you. You see, Frederick Douglass said that there, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. I'm here to tell you today that if you're struggling in your life, trying to get over sins, trying to get over things that are holding you back, you're on the right track. That means the Holy Spirit has entered into your heart. That means you're working and fighting in that battle every day. And according to this text, you will conquer. Now, why will you conquer? It's because there is someone that came down to this world and conquered it all already. There was someone who took off his throne, took off his crown, stepped down off his throne, put on flesh, and came and walked on these dirty streets that we walk on today. There's someone who was tempted like we were. There's someone who faced the same struggles that we face every day, just like us. And he conquered. That same one went to the cross and died just for you. And not only did he die, but he rose again, conquering that second death, conquering just for you. And because he rose again, he can now apply his blood onto you. So his victory, his being able to conquer, is what is going to make you conquer in the end. Romans 8 Verse 37 says that we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. So it is because of Jesus Christ, it is because of the one who came and died for us that we will conquer. It's a surefire thing. You don't have to sit here anymore and wonder if you're going to make it. You don't have to sit here and think and ponder, is there a way, is there something that I can do? Because Jesus came and died for you on the cross already. All you have to do is accept his blood, accept his sacrifice, and according to the Bible, you will be more than a conqueror. So when you look at this text and it says that conquerors will have this heritage, according to my Bible, we've already surpassed that because we have accepted the blood of Jesus Christ. If you all remember John 3.16, 
What does John 3.16 say? Mm -hmm. That he gave you? Uh -huh. Stop! That whosoever believes. Oh, were there, were there anything, was there anything else that follows that? Or whosoever believes and is worthy? For whosoever believes and earned it? No, no, no. It says for whosoever believes. Your job is to believe in Jesus Christ. Believe that he can fight these battles for you. Believe that when you call on his name, when you're struggling, when you're in the middle of your mess, that he'll pull you out with his power. That he loves you enough to pull you from the world and not only forgive you of your sins, not only wipe away everything that is causing you harm, but he'll give you, according to the end of that text, eternal life. As we continue on in this text, going up to verse 6, and I'll start reading at the second half of verse 6, it says, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. You see, for the folks that are fighting, the folks that are struggling, trying to move forward, you start exerting energy. And when your body starts exerting energy, you get thirsty. Your body needs that water to keep on moving. You need that water to give you the energy that you need to continue to push forward. And according to this, if you're thirsty, God says, I'll give you the water that you need. But it's not water like we think. It's not H2O. This water is eternal life. It's water that streams, according to Revelation 22, verse 1, directly from the throne of God and from the Lamb. You see, every time you start talking about saints, in Revelation, whenever you see saints, you always see them connected with the throne of God. So if I'm going to be thirsty, that means I need to go towards the throne to get the water. You see, this throne of God is not something that I have to wait to get to heaven to approach. No, I can approach it right now. When we pray in church, the reason that we like to come forward before the altar, it's because in our minds it helps us picture us coming before the throne of God. And it is from that throne of God that all of our blessings, that all of the grace and mercy that we need to continue to push forward comes from. It doesn't mean that we won't struggle. It doesn't mean that we won't fight. It doesn't mean that as soon as you call on God and say, Jesus, cleanse me and make me whole, that everything is suddenly going to be gone. It's going to be a process. But if you stay at the throne of God, if you stay drinking from that fountain that never runs dry, that water of life that is constantly flowing, ever living, you'll make it. There's a promise here. That the thirsty will receive that water. And those same folks that are thirsty will conquer. Now the question is, how do I know this is true? Well, if you go to the top of verse 6, it says, it is done. What God is trying to say is, that's it. Because you've come to this point with me, it's over. You won. All the devil is trying to do it's just trying to make you think that when you get to the throne, that you're not worthy to stay. But what God is trying to say is, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I've seen your life. I've seen where you come from. I know what your DNA is. I know what makes you up. I know what's going to give you trouble. And as long as you stand here, remember, I'm also the end. I know the outcome of your life. I know what will happen as long as you stand here with me. So there's no reason to feel like you're not worthy because it's not you that makes you worthy. It's God that makes you worthy. It's not you that decides if you can go to Christ. It's not you that decides that you're good enough to get to heaven. It's Jesus Christ that decides whether or not you're good enough. Again, that's why this book ain't got nothing to do with you. This is not a book of the revelation of you. It is a book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's trying to show you his goodness. He's trying to show you his mercy. He's trying to show you that just because you think you're too low, understand that because I'm high, I can save you. Now let's keep going a little bit because when we go up a little further, up in verse 5, it says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. 
Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Let's talk about that one seated on the throne for a second. In Revelation chapter 4, you see the description of God sitting on the throne. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. They list all these jewels that he looks like. And then they say on the throne, there's a rainbow. And the rainbow surrounds the throne. Now, if you can remember after that flood, way back in Genesis, when God flooded the world, what did he send to say that I will never flood the world again? Rainbow. That's God's character. His character is a character of grace. And that grace is so powerful that it is visible around his throne. And when you continue to read through those first five books of the Bible and they start to describe the ark, remember the ark of the covenant is the throne of God. And what is that seat that he sits on? It's called the mercy seat. So now you have God with his literal character shining forward, his character of grace, sitting on the mercy seat. And when you get down to chapter 20, it is this God whose grace is so powerful that it's visible, sitting on the mercy seat that is in charge of judgment. Now you see, when we think about judgment, you have to understand it's not like judges today. It's a Palestinian judge. So instead of having a judge, a jury, then a prosecutor and a defendant, the judge serves as your defendant. In other words, the judge who sits on the throne is trying to find you innocent. So, so, so let, let, let's recap for a second. The one who's sitting on the throne has grace that is so abounding that it literally bends light and shows up in a physical spectrum that we can see. He's sitting on a seat of mercy and he is doing from that throne everything that he can to possibly save you. And this is the one who judges you to see if you're going to be right or wrong. I don't know about you, but that is good news. The game is rigged. You mean to tell me that the one who is in charge of the universe, the one who is in charge of my eternal future, is the one that is fighting for me to make it? If that isn't praiseworthy, I don't know what is. You've got to understand how good God is and how much he loves you, how much he wants to save you. And according to this verse, it is the one that is seated on the throne that says that these words are trustworthy and true. It's that God sitting on that throne that says, if you're thirsty, I'll give you water. He's the one that is sitting on the throne that says, if you conquer, I'll be your God. And you'll be my son. It's the one who is sitting on the throne that says, if you work with me, I promise I'll save you. And you'll never have to worry about it again. It's the one on the throne who says, behold, I am making all things new. Making all things new. All things. That includes us. That includes my heart. That includes everything that is going on inside of me. And what he's saying is he's making it new right now. This is not something that's future tense. It's present tense. It's ongoing. So every day when I wake up and I pray to the one who sits on the throne, every day I can say, Lord, thank you for making me new. Thank you for changing my heart. Thank you for taking these things that are inside of me and working and molding and making me into the thing that you need me to be. But again, this says he's making all things new. So we've talked about the things that are going on internally. But God also promises that the things that are going on externally, he's making new. All the things that are going on outside of you that are pressuring you to make you feel like you can't make it, God says, I'm making that new too. And if we move to verse 1, we'll see what he's talking about. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, y'all, I know we've talked about the sea. If you recall, the sea is a representation of chaos. If you look in Revelation, remember, there's a beast that comes out of the sea. 
The sea is everything that is wrong in this world today. It's all the evil that we see. It's politics. It's racism. It's socialism. It's everything that we see in this book. Everything that we see around us that is evil, persecution, pain, everything, that is the sea. And what God is trying to say is, that sea will be no more. You see, you're worried about what your next paycheck is going to come from. God says that worry is going to be no more. You're worried about what's going to happen now because of the election and we see the division that's going on in this country today. God says that that will be no more. You're worried about where you're going to get your food from. You're worried about what you're going to do next. God says don't worry about it because when I'm through with you, I'm going to keep my promise. And all those things that you're worried about will be no more. The world is going to be made new. The heavens, the skies, the, the things that we see in the skies, the stars, the planets, it's going to be new. And it's not necessarily going to be new in time, but new in quality. You see, when God goes through this new creation, you see him doing things a little bit opposite. Because when you go to Genesis, remember, God made the world first and then made us. According to this, God fixes us first and then makes the world new. And what he does is he still uses the things that are here. The grass isn't evil, so he just rejuvenates the grass. The trees aren't evil, so he, reju he rejuvenates the trees. When you look at Peter, he says he melts away all the evil and uses his power to recreate and make it new. Going down verse 2, when I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Now there's something I didn't say. When God says that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, what he's saying is, I am the Creator. I am the reason for all things. I am the purpose of all things. Yeah. And when he says that he is the end, he is saying that he is the goal of all things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. The reason that we're living today is to get to God. Yeah. And he promised us, remember John 3.16, he promises us eternal life. And in this book, at this moment, we see that promise fulfilled. We see Jesus, we see God saying that finally I'll be able to come down and be with you. I'll be able to physically stand next to you. And when you continue to read this text, he says, I'll be able to wipe away every tear from your eye. If you could get this picture, God is going to take his hand, place it on your face. And wipe the tears from your eyes. He will be here finally, physically, standing with you, with everything gone, every pain, every sorrow, all that misery. It's going to be gone. And I'm going to close up now. With the book of Revelation, what Jesus is trying to tell you He's trying to show you the gospel. That's the good news. Yeah, you're bad. But I died for you. And if you would accept me in your life, I'll make you and everything you know new. It's the gospel. It's good news. There's a song that this makes me think of. It's what I, what I titled the sermon after, Ain't That Good News? What's that song say? I got a home up into that kingdom. Ain't that good news? I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? I'm going to lay down this world, shoulder up my cross, and take it home to my Jesus. Ain't that good news? I've got a Savior in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? I've got a Savior in that kingdom. Ain't that a good news? I'm gonna lay down this world. I'm gonna shoulder up my cross. 
I'm going to take it home to my Jesus. Ain't that a good news? Oh, sing with me. Listen to that again. Come on. I've got a Savior in that kingdom. Ain't that a good news? I've got a Savior in that kingdom. Ain't that a good news? I'm going to lay down this world. I'm going to shoulder up my cross. I'm going to take it home. for those of us that are struggling. For those of us that feel like not making it. For those of us that feel like we can't take that step forward. For those of us that feel like Jesus doesn't want us because we're too bad. Jesus doesn't want us because we've done so much that's wrong. But I want to make a call for you today to let you know that Jesus loves you. It is because of that feeling that Jesus can work inside of you today. And I I don't know who is here that's feeling like that. I don't know who the Spirit has moved today. But I'm just asking that you would come forward. I don't know what it is that God has told you. I don't know what it is that you're going through. I don't know what it is that you're trying to face. But God will face it for you. If you let him, if you give it all to God, if you put it all in his hands, he'll help you move forward. It doesn't have to be a call to join the church. Maybe you just need special prayer. Maybe you just need something. But if that's you today, come down. We want to pray for you. We want to be able to work with you. We want to encourage you. We don't want to embarrass anybody. That's not what this is about. Because when you come down here and you come forward and you make your stand, that's just showing us that we all have work to do to help you to get where it is that you need to be. So for those of you that are online, talk to our online pastors. I make the exact same call to you. Don't be nervous. Let us know what's going on. We'll pray for you. We'll help you make it through. If there's no one, let's stand. Let's all stand. Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us on this Sabbath day, Lord. We thank you so much for giving us this message. Lord, we thank you for just letting us know, Lord, that there is good news. That no matter how bad we are, no matter what it is that we've done, that, Lord, you're still going to accept us and help us to make it to the kingdom. Lord, as we're going through this week, help us to look at your word. Help us to look at Revelation. Help us to look at this very chapter and be reminded of what it is that you promised us, Lord. We stand before you wanting to be more than conquerors and knowing that that can take place, Lord, through you because you love us, because it's what you want from us. Be with us, O God, as we continue on in this journey, as we continue on in this life, Lord. We're thirsty, and we're asking for water from that spring of life. O Lord, we're looking forward to the day when you're going to make this entire world new. But in the meantime, Lord, keep making our hearts new. We thank you, O God, for that good news, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name.